Five Go to Smuggler's Top by Enid Blyton. One fine day, right at the beginning of the Easter holidays, four children and a dog travelled by train together. There was Julian, Dick, their sister Anne, their cousin Georgina and her dog Timmy. Georgina looked more like a boy than a girl because she wore her hair very short and had a determined face like Julian. They all called her George and she would never answer to any other name. As the train pulled into the station, she looked out of the window. Oh, it's so nice to be going home. I love school, but it'll be fun to be at Kieran Cottage and perhaps sail out to Kieran Island and visit the castle there. We haven't been since last summer. And I could do with a holiday. I've worked jolly hard at school this term. <laughs> you must have done. You've got thin, you know. Well, I'll soon get fat at Kieran Cottage. Don't you worry. Aunt Fanny will see to that. She's a great one for trying to fatten people up. Yes. And I hope Father will be in a good temper these holes. He ought to be, because he's just finished some new experiments, Mother says, which have been quite successful. Aunt Fanny was there on the platform to meet them. The four children jumped out and rushed to hug her. Timmy pranced round, barking in delight. He adored George's mother. They all set off in the pony trap. It was very windy and cold, and the children shivered and pulled their coats tightly round them. By the time they got to Kirin Cottage, the wind was howling round the house. The windows rattled, the doors shook, and the mats lifted themselves up and down as the draught got under them. After tea, the children rather hoped that their uncle would retire to his study as he usually did, but this time he didn't. They wanted to play a game, but it wasn't much good with Uncle Quentin there. He really wasn't any good at all, not even at such a simple game as Snap. Do you know a boy called Pierre Lenoir? I believe he goes to your school, Julian. Pierre Lenoir? Oh, you mean old Sooty. Yes, he's in Dick's form. Mad as a hatter. Sooty? Why do you call him that? Silly name for a boy? If you saw him, you wouldn't think so, Uncle Quinton. His hair's as black as soot, eyes like bits of coal, and his name means the black one in French, doesn't it? Yes, quite true. But what a name to give anyone, Sooty. Well, I've been having quite a lot of correspondence with this boy's father. I have a letter from him here. He and I are interested in the same scientific matters. In fact, I've asked him to come and stay with me a few days and bring his boy, Pierre. Oh, really? Well, it wouldn't be bad to have old City here, Uncle. But he's quite mad and can be awfully cheeky. Hmm. Well, I wish I'd asked you about the boy before. Well, we'll see. It was nice to climb the steep stairs to their familiar bedrooms that night. Their long train journey had tired them, but nobody could sleep. The gale was raging round the house so fiercely, shrieking and howling like a live thing. Timmy kept up a continuous low growling, for he did not like the shakes and rattles and howls. Towards dawn, the wind seemed in a fury. Anne thought it sounded as if it was in a horrible temper. She lay and trembled, half frightened. Suddenly, there was a strange noise. It was a loud, woeful groaning and creaking. The two girls sat up, terrified. What could it be? The boys heard it too. Julian leapt out of bed and ran to the window. Outside stood the old ash tree, tall and black in the fitful moonlight. It was gradually bending over. It's the ash! It's falling! Quick, Dick, warn the girls! Everybody, come downstairs, quickly! What's all this noise? 
Julian, what's it? Uncle, Aunt, come downstairs. The ash tree is falling. What? Come on, Fanny. Oh, dear, I knew something would happen. Quentin, we ought to have had that ash tree topped. I knew it would fall in a great gale like this. What has it done to the roof? I'll go and see. Oh, be careful. I will. Well? It's crashed through the attic. The girl's room is ruined. They would have been killed if they'd been in her beds. Next morning, the wind was still high, but the fury of the gale was gone. In the light of day, it was surprising what damage the big tree had done. It had cracked the roof of the house like an eggshell, and the rooms upstairs were in a terrible mess. The first thing is to decide what is to happen to the children, Fanny. They can't remain here while there are no usable bedrooms. They had better go back to school, poor things. No, I have a better idea than that. I've had a letter from that fellow Lenoir this morning. He says, uh, wait a minute, I'll read you a bit. Oh, yes, here it is. It is most kind of you to suggest my coming to stay and bringing Pierre. Allow me to extend hospitality to you and your children also. All are welcome here in this big house. My Pierre will be glad of company, and so will his sister, Maribel. There you are. I call that a most generous invitation. We'll pack all the children off to this fellow's house. But Quentin... No, I shan't hear any arguments. If we hire a car today, they can go at once. But we can't let them go off to strangers like that. They'll hate it. I shouldn't be surprised if George refuses to go. Oh, uh, that reminds me. She's, she's not to take Timothy. Apparently, Lenoir doesn't like dogs. Oh, well then, she won't go. That's foolish, Quentin. George won't go anywhere without Timmy. Well, she'll have to this time. Ah, here are the children now. Uh, I'll ask them what they feel about going. Julian, Dick, Anne, George, could you come here a moment, please? Something to tell you. Yes? You remember that boy I spoke to you about last night? Pierre Lenoir? You had some absurd name for him. Sooty. Sooty, yes. Well, his father has kind invited you to go and stay with him at Smuggler's Top. Smuggler's Top? What's that? The name of his house. It's very old and built on the top of a strange hill, surrounded by marshes over which the sea once flowed. The smuggling went on there in the old days. It's a very peculiar place, so I've heard. So, would you like to go, or would you rather go back to school? Oh, oh no, no, not, no, school. not back to school! Let's go to Smuggler's Top! Yes. yes! Can I take Timmy? No, I'm afraid not. Mr. Lenoir doesn't like dogs. Then I shan't like him. I won't go without Timmy. You'll have to go back to school, then. And wipe off that sulky expression, George. You know how I dislike it. But George wouldn't. She turned away. The others looked at her in dismay. Surely old George wasn't going to get into one of her moods and spoil everything. The others pressed her to change her mind, but she shook them off. Then she went out with Timmy. The others didn't follow her. She wasn't very nice when she was cross. When she came back, she was more cheerful and announced that she had decided to go after all. Aunt Fanny packed them all an early lunch and then a big car came for them. Waving and shouting, the children drove away from Kirin Cottage, sad when they looked back and saw the smashed roof under the fallen tree. George said nothing for a while and the car sped on. It went over a hill and sped down to the bottom. When they got there, George leaned forward and touched the driver's arm. Would you stop, please? We have to pick somebody up here. Pick somebody up? Whatever do you mean, George? You'll see. It's Timmy! I don't know if you're supposed to take that dog in. Your father didn't say anything about him. It's all right. You needn't worry. Start the car again, please. You are a monkey, George. Mr. Lenoir may send him back, you know. Well, he'll have to send me back too, then. The main thing is, I've got Timmy and I'm coming with you. On to Smuggler's Top. Yes? I wonder if we shall have any adventures there. The car sped on 
mostly along the coast, though it sometimes went inland for a few miles. But sooner or later, it was in sight of the sea again. At half past twelve, they stopped and had lunch. When they had finished, they got back into the car and drove off once more. Anne fell asleep, and the others felt drowsy too. It began to rain, and the countryside looked rather dreary. Then the driver told them they would soon be leaving the mainland and taking the road across the marsh. The children sat up expectantly. But it was very disappointing. The marshes were full of mist, and all they could see was the road they were on raised a little higher than the surrounding flat marshland. Stop a minute, could you? I'd like to see what the marsh is like. Well, don't step off the road, and don't let that dog out. Once he runs off the road and into the marsh, he'll be gone for good. What do you mean, gone for good? He means the marsh will suck Timmy down at once. Keep him in the car, George. It's mud. Loose, squelchy mud. Look, when I touch it with my foot, it moves. It would suck you down if you trod heavily on it. Have many travellers been lost in that strange sea marsh driver? Oh, there are many that have never been heard of again. They say there are one or two winding paths that go from the mainland to the hill that were used before the road was built. But unless you know every inch of them, you're off them in a second, and your feet sinking into the mud. It's horrid to think about. Can we see the hill yet? Yes, there it is, looming out of the mist. Castaway Hill, they call it. Strange place it is, and no mistake. The top is out of the mist. See? That must be Smuggler's Top, right at the summit. It looks really old. And look at the tower it has. It's sort of, sort of secret looking somehow, isn't it? Well, it won't be long now, and we'll be there. As they neared Castaway Hill, the road began to slope upwards. They went through a big archway, and they were in an old town, surrounded by high city walls, wide enough to walk on. They drove slowly up the winding high street, and the children peered at the old houses and shops with their diamond-paned windows and stout doors. At last they arrived at Smuggler's Top. It was built of brick and timber, and its front door was as massive as that of a castle. They all got out of the car, and Dick rang the bell. Julian, here you are at last. This is Sooty. Sooty, meet George and Anne. Oh, and this is Maribel, my sister. Hello. Come in, everyone. Oh, I say, that's not your dog, is it? He's mine. I had to bring him. Yes, but no dogs allowed at Smuggler's Top. My stepfather won't allow any dogs here. I thought maybe we could hide him while we were here. But if that's how you feel, I'll go back home in the car. Oh, come back, stupid. We'll think of something. Come on. I know. We'll take the secret passage to my bedroom. No one will see us then. And once we're there, we can make plans to hide the dog. Ready? A secret passage? How thrilling. This way. It starts from the study here. Push this panel. Pull this lever, and hey presto! A panel in the wall has opened! Exactly! Now, come on, don't make a noise. Here we are. The passage comes out in the cupboard in my bedroom. This way. And here we are! It's amazing! And it's all right, George. We're quite safe here. My room and Maribel's room are separated from the rest of the house. We're in a wing on our own, reached by this long passage. See? Timmy could bark if he liked, and no one would know. But doesn't anyone ever come? Who keeps your room tidy? Oh, Sarah the maid does that every morning. But usually no one else comes. Anyway, I've got a way of knowing if anyone opens the door at the end of that passage. How? 
I've rigged up a buzzer that sounds as soon as the door is opened. I'll go along and open it while you stay here. Good, isn't it? I'll say. Did you mean what you said about hiding Timmy, Sooty? I mean, how can he be fed and how can we exercise him? Oh, we'll plan it all. Don't worry. I love dogs. But I have to warn you, if my stepfather ever finds out, we shall get a jolly good telling off. But why doesn't he like dogs? I don't know. But he's an odd sort of man, my stepfather. Odd? How? Well, he seems full of secrets. Strange people come here, you know, and I've seen lights shining from the tower on certain nights. But I don't know who puts them there or why. Do you think your stepfather is a smuggler? I don't think so. We've got one smuggler here and everyone knows him. His name is Barling. Even the police know his goings on. But they can't stop him. He's very rich and powerful. This seems rather an exciting place. I have a feeling there might be an adventure somewhere about. Oh no, nothing happens really. It's only just a feeling you get here, because this place is so old, so full of secret ways and passages. Why, the whole hill is mined with passages in the rock, used by smugglers of olden times. Well, I must... The buzzer! Someone's coming! What shall we do with Timmy? In here! There! Oh, <laughs> hello, Block. It's you. This is Block, my stepfather's man. He's deaf, so you can say what you like. But it's better not to, because he seems to sense what we say. Your stepfather and your mother want to know why you've not brought your friends to see them. Why did you rush up here like this? Uh, because I was so pleased to see them, of course. All right, Block. We'll be down in a minute. Feeling rather unhappy at leaving Timmy locked up in a cupboard, the children followed Sooty and Mary Bell down the stone passage to the oak door. They went through and down a great flight of stairs. Then they went down into the big hall and followed Sooty through a door on the right. Mr Lenoir sat in a big oak chair, while his wife sat in another, looking lost. She was such a tiny woman, like a doll. Ah, Pierre, your manners still need a little polishing, I see. Eh? Well, I hope you all will have a good time here. Pierre and Marie-Belle will show you the old town. And if you promise to be careful, you can walk along the road to the mainland to go to the cinema. Oh, great! A uh, block will give you all your meals in Marie-Belle's schoolroom. Then you will not disturb my husband. He doesn't like talk at mealtimes, and that would be rather hard on six children. Oh, and by the way, Pierre, I forbid you to wander about the catacombs in this hill. Huh? Nor will I have you acting about on the city wall and taking risks. Will you promise me this? I don't act about on the city wall. I don't take risks either. Oh, you play the fool always. Oh, but I was top of my form last year. Enough. Now get out, all of you. <laughs> I didn't promise, did I? He wanted to take all our fun away. This place isn't fun if you don't explore. What are catacombs? Winding secret tunnels in the hill. Nobody knows them at all. You can get lost in them easily. Lots of people have. Why are there so many secret ways and things here? It was a haunt of smugglers, I'll bet. And you say there still is a smuggler here, Sooty? Yes, Barling. You can see his house from your rooms. But what about poor Timmy? Where will he stay? He'll be all right. He can have free run of that passage to my bedroom, and we'll smuggle him out by another secret tunnel that opens halfway down in the town, and give him plenty of exercise each morning. Oh, we'll have a grand time. Next morning, the children took Timmy out for a walk through a secret passage that led to the town. It started in Mary Bell's room, under a heavy stone trap door in the floor. Sooty had a rope ladder, and they all climbed carefully down it while Timmy was lowered down in a laundry basket. Soon they were all standing together at the bottom. There was a musty smell, and the walls were damp and greenish. Sooty swung his torch round, and the children saw various passages leading off here and there. Where did they all lead? I told you this hill was full of tunnels. 
There are miles and miles of them. No one explores them now, though. It's weird. I wouldn't like to be here alone. But what a place to hide smuggled goods in. No one would ever find them, would they? I guess the old-time smugglers knew every inch of these passages. Let's take the one that leads out of the hillside. There's another opening over there, Sooty. Yes, that one goes to Mr. Barling's house somewhere. Most of the old houses have openings like ours. Jolly well hidden some of them are too. There's daylight or something in front. Oh good, I hate this tunnel. Whew, that's better. Where are we? We've come out on the cliff above the marsh. If we get to the path down there, it'll lead us to the place where the city wall is fairly low and we can climb over it. Soon they were over the wall, Timmy too. They set off for a good walk, swinging down the hill. The mist began to clear after a while and the sun felt nice and warm. The town was very old. Some of the houses seemed almost tumble down, but there were people living in them. The shops were quaint with long narrow windows and overhanging eaves. The children stopped to look into them. Suddenly, Sooty noticed Block walking towards them. Look out! It's Block! Don't take any notice of Timmy at all. If he comes around us, pretend to drive him off like a stray. Right. Shh, shh, shh. Go away, you dog. No, go away. Go home, can't you? Is the dog bothering you? If I throw a stone at him, that'll soon make him go. Don't you dare. I don't mind the dog following us. He's nice. Block's deaf, George. It's no good talking to him. But he's about to throw that stone. Hey, stop that. I'll... I'll tell the police. Now, now, what's all this about? Pierre, what's the trouble? Oh, Mr. Barling, I didn't see you. No, nothing's the matter. It's only this dog is following us, and Block was going to throw a stone at it. I see. And uh, who are these children? They've come to stay with us, because their house has been damaged in a gale. Well, it's George's father's house, really. Kieran Cottage. Kieran? Surely that is where that clever scientist friend of Mr. Lenoir lives. Yes. He's my father. Do you know him? Well, I have heard of him and his uh, very interesting experiments. Mr. Lenoir knows him well, I believe. Not awfully well. They just write to each other. But Mr. Lenoir offered to put us up. Ah, yes. Such a generous fellow, your father, Pierre. Well, I must be off. The children stared after Mr. Barling. It was plain that Mr. Barling didn't like Mr. Lenoir at all. Well, neither did they. By now, Block had disappeared too, so the children continued their walk. Two or three days went by, and the children fell into their new life quite happily, and Timmy was taken out for a long walk each dawn. It was turning out to be quite a peaceful holiday after all. Nothing much seemed to happen. But then things did begin to happen and once they had begun, they never stopped. One night, Julian was awakened by someone opening his door. Who is it? Me, Sooty. I say, I want you to come and see something. What? You'll see. Wake Dick and follow me. Sooty led them to a peculiar little room with a view of the tower belonging to the house. The boys stared. Someone was signalling from the tower. Now, who's doing that? Your father? I don't think so. I heard him snoring in his room. It may be Block, up in the tower. I wouldn't trust him an inch. I bet it's Block. Well, let's go and see if his room's empty. Good idea. But for goodness sake, don't let's get caught. This is Block's room along here. I'll just have a peek. I can't hear him. Can you see him? There's quite a bright moon. Yes. Yes, I can. I can see the shape of his body under the blankets. So it's not Block after all. So who could it be? Is there a stranger in the house? 
Let's creep up to the tower to find out. All right. We'll have to be careful, though. You get to it by a spiral staircase, and there's nowhere much to hide. We'd better not all go up. You stay here and wait. I'll see if I can see anything through the keyhole. We'll hide behind this curtain down here. All right. I wonder what he can hear. Don't know, but that sounds like him coming down the stairs. I'll take a peek. No, it's not sooty. It's a man's legs. Stay quiet. Sooty must have managed to hide too. I'll see where he goes. Keeping well in the shadows, Dick crept along the corridor after the signaller. He went across a landing and up the back stairs which led to the staff bedrooms. Then Dick, to his surprise, saw the person disappear silently into Block's bedroom. The door was slightly open and he peeped in. The moonlight lit up all the corners and he could see that the room was empty except for Block sleeping in bed. He went back to find the others to tell them. It was the strangest thing I ever saw. A man goes into a room and completely disappears. Where can he have gone? We really must find out. It's such a mystery. But how did you know there was signalling going on from the tower, Sooty? Quite by accident. I was looking for an old book in that room I took you to. I looked up at the tower and saw a flashing light. And there's someone out at sea who receives the signals. Smugglers, do you think? But it can't be anything to do with your father, Sooty, and blocks asleep. And it can't be Mr Barling, who is a smuggler, because the signal came from this house, not his. It's all very puzzling. Next morning, they again took Timmy out for his walk and met Block again, who stared with great interest at the dog. Back at Smuggler's Top, Timmy was put safely in the secret passage. He'd got quite used to this peculiar life now. He knew his way about the passage, and had explored the other passages that led from it. Soon the children were sitting down to lunch. Block was there, waiting to serve them. He served them with soup, and then went out. Suddenly, to the children's intense surprise and fright, they heard Timmy barking loudly. That's Timmy. He must be in the secret passage behind the wall. Don't say a word in front of Block. Not a word. Pretend not to hear if Timmy barks again. Here he comes now. Now remember, not a word about Timmy. You have finished your soup. I will bring your main course. Jolly good soup that was today, I must say. Oh yes, jolly good. I wonder how they're getting on at Kieran Cottage, George. Yes, I wonder. Thank you, Block. <laughs> yes, thank you, Block. I hope old Block is as deaf as a post. I could have sworn I saw a surprised look when Timmy barked. Shh! He's coming back. Oh, father! Yes, Pierre, who did you expect? I see you are enjoying your dinner. Uh, does Bloc wait on you properly? Oh, yes, thank you. We're having a very nice time here. Oh, uh, that's good. Uh, that's... Shh. Did you hear that noise? What noise? Don't be foolish, it's a dog. Sorry, but I can't hear a dog. When I catch it, I will have it poisoned. I will not have dogs here. Shut up, silly. Block will be back in a minute. We must pretend to be surprised Mr. Lenoir thought there was a dog here, because if Block can read our lips, he mustn't know the truth. Well, I'm going home. I'm not risking Timmy being poisoned. You can't. It would look funny. And then we won't have a chance to solve this mystery with Sooty. Well, I'll telephone to say I'm homesick and want to go back. You can all stay and solve the mystery. George slipped down the passage and down the stairs to where the telephone was enclosed in a little dark cupboard. She dialed the number she wanted and it rang at Kirin Cottage. But nobody answered it. George put down the receiver miserably. She would try again later. But each time she tried there was no reply. 
As she was coming out of the telephone cupboard for the third time, Mrs. Lenoir saw her. Have you been trying to telephone home? Haven't you heard? Heard what? Oh, your mother rang to say it's impossible to live at Kirin Cottage with men hammering everywhere, so they were going away for a week or so. But Mr. Lenoir has asked them here. They will let us know soon if they can come. I see. Oh, you don't sound very pleased, dear. No, no, I am. It's just I know. Why don't you and the other children all come down to the drawing room after tea? We could have a game of cards.、Uh, Mr. Lenoir is out tonight on important business. He doesn't like his evenings disturbed when he's at home, so I haven't been able to see as much of you all as I should have liked. Ah, I expect that's your parents now. Hello. Yes. Oh, certainly. Yes. Well, of course. Good. We look forward to seeing you then. Goodbye. That was your father, George. He is coming on his own. They were at your aunt's, and your mother thinks she should stay because your aunt is not very well. But your father would like to come and discuss his latest experiments with Mister Lenoir. The children would very much rather have had Aunt Fanny instead of Uncle Quentin, who could be very difficult at times. But he would probably be talking with Mister Lenoir most of the time, so that would be all right. After they had finished their game with Missus Lenoir that evening, the children all went up to bed. George went to get Timmy to take him to her room. Sooty went to see that the coast was clear. As he went across the landing that led to his own room, he noticed two shoes sticking out from under the thick curtains drawn across the landing window. He looked at them in surprise, then grinned and ran to tell the others. It's old Block. He obviously suspects we have a dog, and he's posted himself there to watch. Well, we'll give him a nasty shock. What will we do? I'll get a rope, and we'll all go downstairs to the landing. I'll suddenly yell out that there's a robber behind the curtains, and I'll pounce on Block. Then, with your help, Julian and Dick, we'll fold him up in the curtains. A good jerk will bring him down. And while that's going on, I can slip by with Timmy. Yes. Come on then. I'll get the rope. Ready. Ah! A robber! Help! There's a robber hiding here. Get him! <laughs> Quick, get the rope. Let's tie him up. What's all this? Have you children all gone mad? We've caught a robber and tied him up. A robber? Where? He was hiding behind the curtain, Mister Lenoir. Call the police. Let me go. Let me go. Oh dear, it's Block. Untie him quickly. But it can't be Block. Uh, he was hiding behind the curtain. Do as you're told. I can hardly believe it. Tying up my servant. If he leaves, it will be your fault. The children hoped fervently that Block would leave. It would be marvelous to have the deaf, blank-faced fellow out of the house. He was on the watch for Timmy. They felt sure, but Block was still there next morning, and there was a shock for George when Sooty came to her with some bad news. I say, George, what do you think? Your father's going to have my room when he comes. What? It's true. I've got to sleep with Julian and Dick. Block's moving my things out. I hope we can get Timmy out in time. But Block stayed in the room all morning cleaning it. When he eventually left to see to luncheon, George rushed to the door of Sooty's room, eager to get poor Timmy. But she couldn't open the door. It was locked, and Block had taken the key. 
By now, George was in despair. She went to find Sooty. Sooty, I shall have to get into that secret passage the way you first took us in. Through your father's study room, you know. We can't. He uses it now, and he'd half kill anyone who went in there. But I've got to get in there somehow. Timmy may starve. <sighs> the door's open. Perhaps I could just peek. <sighs> no one there. Good. Now's my chance. Now, which was the panel? Oh, where was the place Sooty pressed? Here? Oh, no. <gasps> it must be here. I've got to hurry. Oh, where can it be? Now, what exactly do you think you are doing? Oh, Mr. Lenoir. How dare you come into my study and mess about like this? Hmm? How dare you? What are you doing in my study, huh? I... No, I don't want to hear any excuses. I've never known anything like it, you impudent child. I'm going to tell Block to take you to your room, lock you in and give you nothing but bread and water for the rest of the day. That will teach you to behave yourself in future. My father won't be very pleased when he hears you're punishing me like... Ah, wait till he hears how you misbehave yourself. Nobody is allowed in my study. Poor George was soon being propelled upstairs by Block, who was only too delighted to be punishing one of the children. Julian, Dick and the others rushed upstairs just in time to see him shove George roughly into her room and lock the door. There. Hey, what are you doing? Here, unlock that door, do you hear? Let go of my arm. Mr. Lenoir gave me orders to punish that girl. You jolly well unlock that door. Give me that key. Ah, get away. The brute. Are you all right, Julian? Y yes, I think so. But what about George? George? Whatever's happened? Mr. Lenoir caught me in his study. I was going to go through that secret passage to rescue Timmy. How shall I go to bed tonight? All my things are in your room. He'll have to sit with me. I'll lend you a nighty. But what will your father say when he comes, George? I hope he say he'll be set free at once. He won't. He'll just think I've been in one of my bad moods. Oh, I wish Mother was coming too. The others were very upset about George, as well as about Timmy. Things seemed to be going very wrong indeed. George felt lonely when the others had gone to tea. She was hungry and she wanted Timmy. Angry and miserable, she longed to escape. She went to the window and looked out. Her room looked straight down the cliffside. Below was the city wall that ran round the town. George knew she could not jump down to the wall, but she suddenly remembered the rope ladder they had used to go down into the pit that led to the secret passage into the town. It had first been in Marybelle's room, but they were afraid that Block might find it, so George had smuggled it into her room. Now, her hands shaking with excitement, she unlocked her suitcase and took out the rope ladder. When the others came back, she told them what she was going to do, speaking with a low voice through the door. I'll get down onto the wall, walk along it, and then jump down and creep back into the house. Get some food for me somehow, and I'll have it then. And later tonight, when everyone has gone to bed, I'll creep out again and get into the study and find a way through to the secret passage. Sooty can help me. Then I can get Timmy. Right. Wait till it's fairly dark before you climb down, though. Block's gone to bed with a headache, but the others are around. So when twilight came, George slid down the rope ladder to the city wall and walked along it. She passed by several houses and could look in the windows of those that were not curtained. In one, she got a great surprise. Surely, surely that was Block in there. He had his back to her, but she could have sworn it was Block. And he was talking to Mr. Barling, the smuggler of Castaway Hill. But wait a minute. Could it be Block? Block was deaf, and this man evidently wasn't. When she got back to Smuggler's Top, she reported what she had seen to the others, who were waiting for her with a little feast. I raided the larder. 
Cook's out, and Block's gone to bed for a rest with his headache. Then it couldn't have been Block I saw. But I'm certain it was. Go and have a peep in his room, Sooty. All right. I'm certain it was him, Julian, sitting there talking to Mr Barling. Did you see his face? No, but I'd know him from the back, I'm sure. It certainly is very puzzling. You're telling me. Ah, oh, here's Sooty back again. Well? He's in bed. So there are two blocks, then. Is my father here yet? Yes, just arrived. He's awfully tired and a bit cross, though, and frightfully annoyed with you for misbehaving. He said you were to be locked up tomorrow, too, if you don't apologise. Apologise? I shan't. But I'll have to get Timmy tonight, or he'll be frantic. I'll go round and climb back in my window again now, then wait until dark... And you must let me back into the house, Sooty, and open the secret way for me. All right. You'd better go back now. Here, take some buns. Thanks. At midnight, George crept out again and went to the side door of the house. Sooty was there and let her in. But when they got to his father's study, it was locked. So Sooty offered to creep into his old bedroom, where George's father was sleeping, and get into the secret passage that way. But, Sooty, the buzzer will go as soon as you open the door. Idiot. I disconnected it as soon as I knew my room was going to be changed. Right, here we are. Your father sounds a bit restless. I'll slip into the cupboard and open the secret passage. Then as soon as I've got Timmy, I'll bring him along. Wait in Maribel's room, if you like. Sooty crept into the room where George's father lay. He knew every creaking floorboard and avoided them. He made his way to a big chair, meaning to hide behind it. For some time the man tossed and turned, but at last George's father grew quiet. Sooty cautiously moved out from behind the chair. Then something startled him. He heard a sound over by the window. Was someone opening it? No. The window itself did not move, but the top of the window seat beneath the window was slowly moving upwards, and a figure climbed out. Sooty felt the hair rising on his head. He was terribly afraid. The figure tiptoed over to the bed, made a quick movement, and Sooty guessed that George's father had been gagged. Then the intruder lifted the limp body from the bed and put him down inside the window seat. Sooty suddenly found his voice. Hey, what are you doing? Who are you? Mr. Barling? Oh, oh. Someone had hit him a hard blow on the head, and he remembered nothing more at all. He did not know he was lifted into the window seat, or that the intruder followed after him. George, hearing Sooty cry out, was extremely startled. She went to the door next to her and listened. But now there was absolutely no sound at all. She put her head round the door and shone her torch into the room. What? The room's empty. But where's Father? Where's Sooty? What's that? Oh no, I can hear someone coming. Where can I hide? Where can I... <gasps> Under the bed, yes. It's Block, I'm sure. He's gone to the window seat. But what's he doing? For about five minutes, the person worked at his task by the window seat. Then, as quietly as he came, he left. When all was quiet again, George slipped through the door of Julian's bedroom and told them what had happened. They were amazed and went to Mary Bell's room to wake her and Anne. Soon all five children were in the room from which George's father and Sooty had so strangely vanished. But why call out Mr Barling's name? It doesn't make sense. I know, but I'm sure it was Mr Barling's name that I heard Sooty call out. Do you think... Oh yes, do you think 
Mr. Barling could possibly have crept through the secret opening in the cupboard to do some dirty work and gone back the same way. Let's look. Look at that. The handle to open the secret door is gone. Someone's removed it. Oh, no! So now I can't even get Timmy. I'm sure Mr. Lin Warren is at the bottom of this. I bet it was Block you saw in here, George. Well, then we can't tell them what's happened if they are at the bottom of it all. And we can't tell your mother, Mary Bell, or she'll go to your father about it. <gasps> oh, what will we do? I want Sooty. I'm sure he's in danger. We'll rescue him tomorrow. Don't you worry. We can't do anything tonight. I vote we go to bed. Sooty and Uncle Quentin may have turned up again by the morning. If they haven't, Mr. Lenoir will have to be told, and we'll see his reaction. We'll soon know if he has anything to do with this mystery or not. George, you go and sleep with Anne and Mary Bell next door. Dick and I will sleep here. Next morning, Julian and Dick were woken when Sarah the maid came in with tea for Uncle Quentin. She couldn't believe her eyes to find the two boys in the visitor's room, but no visitor. Then Block discovered George in Mary Bell's room, when he thought she was locked in her own room, and went to get Mr. Lenoir. In a few minutes, he came along looking puzzled and upset, with Mrs. Lenoir, who looked scared out of her life. Julian, tell me what has happened, quickly. Uncle Quentin disappeared from his bed last night, and Sooty's vanished too. I think you are keeping something back. You will tell us everything you know, please. Tell him, Julian. I'm going to the police. Perhaps you will talk to them, my boy. I shouldn't have thought you would want to go to the police. You've got too many secrets to hide. Pardon? What do... <laughs> Ah, uh, Block, come in. There seems to have been peculiar happenings here. No. What we want to say is not to be said in front of Block. We don't trust him. What do you mean? What do you know about my servants? I've known Block for years. He can't help being deaf. I know that makes him irritable, but I insist you tell me all you know. I'd rather tell the police. Oh, this is intolerable. Oh, go away, Block. You'd better all come down to my study. Mr. Lenoir wasn't behaving as they had thought he might behave. He seemed sincerely puzzled and upset. Surely he wouldn't do that if he had had a hand in the disappearances. So Julian told him all they knew about the strange signalling from the tower, and how they had followed the signaller to Block's room, where he had disappeared. Uh, got out of the window, I suppose. Oh, Block's got nothing to do with this. You can rest assured of that. He's most faithful and loyal. I have an idea that Mr. Barling is at the bottom of this. He can't signal from his house to the sea because he's not high enough up the hill. He must have been using my tower, coming himself to do it. He knows all the secret ways of this house better than I do. It would be easy for him. But I really don't see why Block shouldn't know all this. It's plain that Barling could explain a lot. I'll see if Block has ever suspected anything. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'll see what Block thinks about everything, and if we can't solve this mystery ourselves, we'll get in the police. Later, when the children were alone, Julian thought it was time they did a little mystery solving themselves. He and Dick decided to go down to Mr. Barling's house. Perhaps Sooty and Uncle Quentin were hidden there. After all, George had distinctly heard Sooty yell out, Mr. Barling, so it must have been him who was the kidnapper. But when they got to the house, they found it shut up. A gardener next door told them he'd gone away for a holiday and was on his own. So what had he done with his captives? Meanwhile, George had been doing some snooping on her own. She had slipped into Uncle Quentin's room to see if there was another secret passage. She had tried the cupboard again, wishing she could get into the secret passage there and find Timmy. But nothing. She was about to leave when she noticed something lying on the floor. A screw. Then she remembered the squeaky noises she'd heard made by whoever it was at the window seat. Of course, it was screws being screwed into the seat. She rushed off to get a screwdriver. Ah! Oh, that's the last one. Now let's see what's in here. George, where are you? In here. Come in, all of you. You'd better lock the door, too. What are you doing? This is how he got in. What? See. 
Look at that! I bet even Old Sooty didn't know about this. Shall we go down and see if we can find Timmy? Where does it go? We'll find out. Sooty says the whole hill is honeycombed with underground passages. Oh, someone's trying to get in! Why is this door locked? Open it at once! It's Father! I'd better unlock the door! Put the seat back, George. Dick and Anne, you sit on it. What are all you children doing in here? Just wondering how Uncle Quentin and Sooty could have disappeared. Well, I've had a good talk with Block. Just as I thought, he doesn't know a thing about all the goings on. He was amazed to hear about the signalling. But he doesn't think it's Mr. Barley. Oh. Yes, it's, it's quite upset, Block. I've told him to have a rest in his room till we decide what to do next. I've rung the police, but the inspector is out. He'll ring me as soon as he's back. Now, can you all keep out of mischief just for a while? When Mr. Lenoir had gone, Julian went to see if Block really was in his room. Yes, the door was a little ajar, and he could see the shape of Block's body in the bed. He came back, and they all climbed one by one into the hole under the window seat. As they had thought, it led to another secret passage in the house. But this one went straight downwards, so they were soon well below the house. Then they came into a maze of tunnels. Look here. We can't possibly go any further. We shall get lost. We haven't got Sooty, and Mary Bell isn't any good at finding the way. Shh! What's that? I can hear footsteps. Switch off your torch, Julian. Let's hide in this opening. Have a peek out, Anne. Can you see anything? It's two people. One's tall and thin. The other... The other looks like Block. How can it be? They've turned down a tunnel along there. Shall we follow them? Of course not. Supposing they suddenly turned back and found us. And I'm sure the other one was Mr. Barling, too. But he's gone away. Supposed to have gone away, you mean? I wonder where they're going. To Father and Sooty, I bet. When they got back to Smuggler's Top, Julian went to see if Block was still in his bed. He pushed open the door. Yes, there he was. But something made Julian curious. He went over to the bed and put his hand on the shoulder. Then he got a real shock. It wasn't Block at all. It was just pillows made to look like a body under the sheets. Meanwhile, Uncle Quentin and Sooty were in a dark cave at the end of a very old passage that even Sooty didn't know. There was no way they could escape. They would just get lost. All they could do was wait until their captors came back. And in due course, Mr. Barling did come, bringing Block with him. Block carried some food, which was very welcome to the prisoners. You beast, Block! How dare you help in this? You wait till my stepfather hears about this. Unless he's in it too. Hold your tongue. So you can hear. All this time you've been pretending you can't. What a lot of secrets you must have overheard. And you shall answer to the police. I demand to be taken to Smuggler's Top. Oh, you do, do you? Well, I have a very generous proposal to make. I know why you've come to Smuggler's Top. And why you and Lenoir are so interested in each other's experiments. How do you know? Hmm? Spying, I suppose. I bet Block's been spying and reading letters. Now, my dear sir, I will tell you very shortly what I propose. I know you have heard I am a smuggler. I am. It's easy to run a smuggling trade here because no one can patrol the marshes or stop men using the secret path that only I and a few others know. On favourable nights, I send out a signal, or rather, Block does it for me. So it was Block. Then, when the goods arrive, I dispose of them. Why are you telling me this? It's of no interest to me. I'm only interested in a plan for draining the marshes, not in smuggling goods across them. <laughs> exactly, my dear fellow. I know that. I have even seen your plans. But the draining of the marshes means the end of my business. My ships will no longer be able to slip in unseen, bringing valuable cargoes. So why have you kidnapped me? I know Mr. Lenoir is going to buy your plans from you. He hopes to make a lot of money by selling the land once it is drained. But that marsh 
is not going to be drained. I'm going to buy your plans. Do you want to drain the marsh, then? No. <laughs> your plans will be burnt. Name your price, dear sir, and sign this document making over all your plans to me. I don't deal with madmen or with rogues. This is what I think of your document, Mr. Barling. Hooray! Good for you, Uncle Quinton. Where's my rope? I'll thrash you for that. That's all right, Block. Thrash him and then this obstinate fool. We'll soon bring them to their senses. A good thrashing and a few days here in the dark without any food. Right. Oh, ow! This'll oh. teach you. Ooh, ow, 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 ow. Sparling, help me. Ow! 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 Oh, Timmy! Oh, Timmy! Good dog! Bite him again, Timmy! Oh. Ow! 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 Oh, I'm getting out of here. Well done, Timmy. Well done. What a good dog you are. There you go. Did you find the way out of the secret passage you were in? You must be starved. Look, here's some food. Uncle Quentin, Timmy could take us safely back to Smuggler's Top, couldn't he? Can you take us home, old boy? Home to George? Timmy ran down the passage a little, but soon came back. He didn't like the idea of going down there. Mr. Barling and Block might be waiting for them all. They were not likely to give in so easily. But Timmy knew other ways about the tunnels. So he set off in the darkness with Uncle Quentin's hand on his collar and Sooty following close behind. It wasn't easy or pleasant, especially for Uncle Quentin, who was dressed only in pyjamas. Back at Smuggler's Top, Mr. Lenoir, having found out that Block hadn't been in his bed, was suddenly convinced that Block was a spy put into his house by Mr. Bowling. Then Julian told him of the way through the window seat and how they had seen Mr. Barling and Block in the underground tunnels. Good heavens! Barling must be mad! This is a plot! They must have heard what I'm planning with your uncle and want to stop me. Oh la la, this is serious! If only we had Timmy! Who's Timmy? Well, I may as well tell you everything, Mr. Lenoir. Timmy's my dog. I'm afraid... Well, you could say I smuggled him into the house. He's... He's somewhere in those secret passages, and I don't know where. Oh, it's very foolish of you. If you had told me, I would have had someone in the town look after him. I can't help not liking dogs. I detest them. But could I... Could I go and see if I could find Timmy? We know the way into the secret passage from your study. So, that's why you are hiding there. Well, go and find him if you like, but don't let him anywhere near me. We won't. Soon they were all squeezing through the panel into the narrow passage that led up to Sooty's bedroom. But Timmy was not there. Then George remembered Sooty telling them there was a way into other passages and thought Timmy must have somehow got through. So they went back and, as they walked behind the dining room wall, they noticed a small door. They went through it and found themselves in yet another passage. It suddenly sloped downwards and led them to the pit below the window seat. Yes, look, there's the tunnel where we saw Block and Mr. Barling go. <gasps> Do you think they've done something to Timmy? He'll be all right, I'm sure, George. I hope so. I say, look at this. String. There's some string leading all the way down this tunnel. So that's how Mr. Barling and Block find their way. So it could lead to where they've taken Father and Sooty. I'm going to follow the string. Who's coming with me? Oh, I'm me. coming. I'll lead the way. Follow me, everyone. Someone's coming. Switch off your torch, Julian. Footsteps. Do you think it's Uncle Quentin? No, I don't think so. Good heavens. Who's here? What are you doing here? Mr. Barling. We came to look for my uncle and Sooty. Where are they? Aren't they here? And is that horrible brute of a dog gone? <gasps> Was Timmy here? Where is he? Do you mean you don't know where they are? <laughs> if they've gone off on their own, they'll never come back. 
It's all your fault, you horrid man! Shut up, Anne! Mr Barling, I think you'd better come back with us and explain things. Mr Lenoir is talking to the police. Oh, is he? Then it would be as well for us to stay down here. And you too. I'll make Mr Lenoir squirm. I'll hold you all prisoners. Got some rope, Block? Oh, Timmy! Timmy, where are you? He's not here. Tie them up, Block. You're mad. You must be mad to do things like this. Mad, am I? I'll show you who's... <coughs> oh! I'll call him off or he'll kill us! Mr. Barling and Block fled. They disappeared into a dark tunnel, staggering around without a light, trying to find their way back. But they missed the string and went wandering away in the darkness, groaning and terrified. The children, however, had a lantern, two torches and Timmy to guide them. He led them easily down the tunnel to where Uncle Quentin and Sooty were. Uncle Quentin! Sooty! Hello, here we are! How did you get here? Did Timmy go back for you? He suddenly rushed off and left us here. Uh, what happened? Heaps! Well, I suppose we ought to be getting back, or the police will be sending out bloodhounds to trace us all. Won't Mr Lenoir be surprised to see us all turning up together? I just wish I wasn't in pyjamas. I feel most peculiar walking around like this. Soon they were all back at Smuggler's Top, and were they glad to be there. The household bustled round and got hot water for bathing Uncle Quentin's feet, a dressing gown for him, food for everyone, and hot drinks. It was really a most exciting time, and now that the thrills were over, the children felt rather important to be able to relate so much. Then the police came in, and the inspector asked a lot of questions. Mr Lenoir was perhaps the most surprised person there. When he heard how Barling had actually offered to buy the plans for draining the marsh, and admitted to being a smuggler, he sat back in his chair, unable to say a word. Well, we've tried to catch him in the smuggling business for many a time, but he was too artful. Fancy him planting block here as a spy, sir, and using your tower for signalling. Bit of nerve, that. And Block isn't deaf after all. That was clever. Do you think we ought to do something about Block and Mr Barling? For all we know, they're still wandering about in that maze of tunnels, and they were bitten by Timmy. Oh yes, that dog saved your lives, I should think. Sorry you don't like dogs, Mr Lenoir, but you have to admit it was lucky he was there. Yes, yes it was. Where is he, actually? I don't mind seeing him, uh, well, just for a moment. I'll get him! Block never wanted dogs, either. I suppose he was afraid they might bark at his comings and goings. Very likely, sir. Here he is. Mr. Lenoir, meet Timmy. Timmy, shake paws. Shake? Oh, no, I don't think I could. No, 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 you know how I detest dogs. Go on. Oh, all right, well, well, if I must. Oh, well, he doesn't seem like a, a dog at all. He's rather a fine fellow. <laughs> <laughs> when the next day came, and no one had found Mr. Barling and Block in the maze of tunnels, the inspector asked George if she would let Timmy go down into the tunnels and hunt them out. So Timmy once more went underground into the hill and hunted for his enemies. He found them after a while, lost in the maze of passages, hungry and thirsty, in pain and frightened. He took them like sheep to where the police waited for them. And after that, Mr. Barling and his friends disappeared from public life for quite a long time. The police must be glad to have got them at last. They have tried to stop this smuggling for a long time. When Block found out about my ideas for draining the marsh, Barling was afraid that that would be the end of all his excitement. <laughs> no more smuggling. Do you know the police have found a cave full of smuggled goods inside the hill? Well, if you'll excuse me, I must get on with my work. We're leaving Smuggler's Top. Uh, did you know? Really? Yes. Mother was so upset when I disappeared. She made Father promise he'd sell the place and leave if I came back safe and sound. Mother's thrilled. So am I. I don't like Smuggler's Top. It's too weird and lonely. Well, if it makes you happy to leave it, I'm glad. But I like it. I think it's a lovely place, set on a hilltop like this, with mists at its foot and secret ways all around. 
I'd be sorry never to come again. So will I. Me too. It's an adventurous place, isn't it, Timmy? Do you like it, Timmy? Have you enjoyed your adventure here? <coughs> well, now perhaps we'll have a nice peaceful time. I don't want any more adventures. Oh, oh but, but we, we do! <laughs> <laughs> And no doubt they'll get them. Adventures always come to the adventurers. There's no doubt about that.